Lebanese Prime Minister has called for a state of emergency to be declared following blasts in Beirut that killed at least 73 and injured 3,700. The Colombian Supreme Court has ordered that former President Alvaro Uribe be placed under house arrest. The Ugandan Electoral Commission has banned campaign rallies ahead of the 2021 general elections due to the risk posed by the novel coronavirus. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south, I'm Katrina Goss. We begin in Lebanon where Prime Minister Hassan Diab called for a state of emergency to be declared after explosions in Beirut killed at least 73 and injured over 3,000. According to the authorities, the blasts were caused by a fire in facilities of the Beirut port area, specifically in a section that housed highly explosive materials. The governor of Beirut, Marwan Aboud, stated that the explosions affected half of the buildings in the Lebanese capital. The first blast struck the city's port shortly after 6 p.m. local time on Tuesday. Within minutes, reports emerged of another, even more devastating explosion. Eyewitness footage of the blast showed the extensive damage to the surrounding area as a massive cloud of dust and debris shot into the sky. Health Ministry Director General Fadi Sanan stressed that the number of casualties was a provisional toll. An investigation is underway to discover the exact cause of the fire. And Wednesday was declared a national day of mourning in Lebanon. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Hassan Diab has stressed that those responsible for the massive blast in Beirut would be held to account. It will not pass without accountability. Those responsible for this catastrophe will pay the price. This is a promise to the martyrs and the injured. This is a national commitment. And Lebanese President Michel Aoun called for an emergency cabinet meeting following the devastating blasts in Beirut. Meanwhile, Health Minister Hamad Hassan has stressed that hospitals in the capital have been overwhelmed by the numbers of casualties. The International Labour Organization's Convention No. 182 on the Worst Forms of Child Labour achieved universal ratification this Tuesday to become the first Labour Convention ratified by all of the ILO's member states. And as of today, every country in the world, and so every child in the world, has legal protection against these forms of extreme abuse. It doesn't mean it's going to disappear overnight, but it does mean that the international community, all of it, has now equipped itself with instruments, um, possibilities, traction, uh, ways in which we can move towards where we want to get to, which is a world free of child labour. The newly elected Parliament of North Macedonia held its first session on Tuesday following the July 15th general elections. My promises and the promises from the Social Party Union and its coalition are a serious guarantee for the next successful four years of governance. I believe there will be an increase in better living conditions for our citizens, and this is a serious guarantee besides the numbers of member parliaments to ensure stability for the next four-year mandate. Our party for the coming period will focus on the talks for creating a parliamentary majority, which also means a new government, a government that will deal with real problems, with problems that preoccupy our citizens. President of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, announced his recovery from COVID-19 this Tuesday while urging citizens to adopt a healthy lifestyle to reduce the risks of the novel coronavirus. The pandemic shows that people with weakened immune systems are in the risk zone. That's why everyone has to adapt a healthy lifestyle. Healthy food, fresh air and sports are essential. This is the person who went through this, telling you that. If you sit at home, you will always get sick. I will be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Colombian Supreme Court has ordered that former President Alvaro Uribe be placed under house arrest as a preventative measure for alleged bribery and procedural fraud. The ongoing case against Uribe is one of the most important of recent years in Colombia. More than 7,000 testimonies have been analysed as part of the process. The ruling was notified immediately and came into effect this Tuesday. The Uribe case will be discussed again next Thursday, although the judges could call another extraordinary meeting. 
And just a few hours after the decision of the Supreme Court, Colombian President Ivan Duque made public his position against the house arrest. He has always answered all the calls of justice with courage, with his head held high. It hurts as a Colombian that many of those who have lacerated the country with barbarism defend themselves in freedom, or are even guaranteed never to go to prison, and that an exemplary public servant, who has occupied the highest dignity of the state, is not allowed to defend himself in freedom with the presumption of innocence. I am and I will always be a believer in the innocence and honorability of a man who by his example has earned a place in Colombia's history. As president, I call for reflection. I understand the role of institution and the separation of powers. As a citizen and a believer in institutions, I hope that the judicial channels will operate and that there will be full guarantees so that an upright human being can fully and freely exercise his defense. And Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro spoke out in relation to the house arrest of former Colombian President Alvaro Uribe, accused of procedural fraud and bribery. The government of Colombia is in the hands of the mafia. Today the Supreme Court of Colombia ordered a house arrest rather than jail for former President Alvaro Uribe Vélez, alias El Matarife precisely because of his direct links to paramilitarism. As in the case of Al Capone, he is being held for a so-called minor offense, but not the many years of drug trafficking, so many accusations, so much evidence against Álvaro Uribe Vélez of having been the key element for Pablo Escobar Gaviria. And President Maduro highlighted the role of the Venezuelan armed forces in the face of ongoing Colombian drug trafficking. How many complaints? Yesterday, some photos and evidence of Álvaro Uribe Vélez pilot appeared. The pilot of a private plane owned by Álvaro Uribe Vélez, and that served as a private plane in Ivan Duque's election campaign. The pilot went down in a plane in Guatemala with a gigantic stash of cocaine. The pilot of Álvaro Uribe Vélez and Ivan Duque was a pilot for drug trafficking by the Mexican and Colombian drug cartels. How about that? And as the paramilitaries and drug traffickers took over Nariño Palace in Colombia, we have to increasingly prepare ourselves to combat drug trafficking at the border, to combat the conspiracies and defend the land of Bolívar and the land of Chávez as a sacred land. And Colombian Congressman for the Common Alternative Revolutionary Force Party, Carlos Antonio Lozada, also responded to the house arrest of Senator Álvaro Uribe. The decision by the Supreme Court of Justice to order house arrest against Senator Álvaro Uribe strengthened the rule of law. We have lived through very difficult days with undue pressure from the executive branch of the high courts. This voice of independence can only strengthen Colombian institutions. Colombian analyst and specialist on peace issues Carlos Medina has stressed that the house arrest of former Colombian President Álvaro Uribe is not linked to the many serious criminal accusations leveled against him during his presidential term. This sentence comes mainly due to a charge of bribery of witnesses, fabrication and obstruction of justice, and for the orders against Congressman Ivan Cepeda, which are now reversed by the Supreme Court, and which placed President Uribe in the situation in which he is now. The proceedings leading to his imprisonment are not the process regarding links to drug trafficking, paramilitaries, and false positives, and all those criminal acts. Rather, this is a process on witness tampering, procedure due fraud and bribery. And the Colombian analyst noted that the Supreme Court's decision could spark violent reactions. I believe that it must be taken into consideration because it has produced a number of reactions in our country which exacerbate tensions and to some extent make things difficult. Due to the convergence of three sectors at this political and legal moment that Senator Alvaro Uribe is facing, one sector that mainly reacts in a violent way against the Kurds and is headed to a certain extent by President Ivan Duque, who does not accept this decision by the Supreme Court. 
The Bolivian Workers' Centre, the country's chief trade union federation, announced on Tuesday that protests would continue against the decision to postpone the general elections, which were scheduled to be held on September 6. Demonstrators announced they will continue to block roads and highways nationwide while occupying the main streets in the cities of La Paz, Oruro and Cochabamba. A group of protesters gathered in front of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal building this Tuesday, announcing a hunger strike to demand respect for the Bolivian constitution and for the vote to take place on the previously agreed date. The Electoral Tribunal announced last week that the general elections would be held in October, marking the fourth time the vote has been postponed following the coup against former President Evo Morales last year. In Chile, the recent attacks by armed civilian groups on members of the Mapuche community have sparked condemnation. The Public Prosecutor's Office has announced it is investigating the events, but nobody has been detained for the violent acts so far. There are almost 3,000 kilometers between the city of Arica in northern Chile and the town of Puerto Saavedra in the extreme south. However, in both places, as well as throughout the national territory, there were widespread demonstrations to protest racist acts against the Mapuche people. The images of people screaming and being lynched under the eye and tolerance of the national police force have been seen all over the world. That's why several members of parliament are taking actions to find out who is responsible. We are seeing groups, civilian bands that publicly call to the beat and lynch our brothers. The story started when members of the Mapuche community occupied five municipalities to bring the national attention to prisoners doing a hunger strike. The local authorities refused to dismantle the protest, but civilian groups to organize themselves and violently attack the peaceful demonstrators. All of this right after the Interior Minister Victor Perez visited the area. It's enough. How many raised the hands to go here at 12? We met at 12 in the square. You have to go with sticks, with whatever you need to defend yourself. But we have to recover the municipality today. And that's how things happened. The national police force was there, but they did nothing to prevent the violent attacks, and they saw how a ceremonial Mapuche center located in Victoria Square was set on fire. The national police force did not act as expected, which encouraged the burning groups that honestly are just criminal groups. They committed a hate crime because what they said and what we saw was the idea that the one that doesn't attack is Mapuche. After the attacks, the police detained tens of people from Curacautin, Traigen, Ercilla and Kulipuli, but none of them were part of the violent groups. They were all Mapuches. The state of Chile has not fulfilled its duty to guarantee peace respecting human rights and condemning any expression of racism. The criticism comes from all sectors, the College of Psychologists, Anthropologists and Journalists. The Ombudsman's Office made an appeal against the Ministry of Interior and the Senate in order to call the attention of international and national organizations on this matter. To the Chilean people, please don't ignore us. Remember that this land where you are living is not yours. This land belongs to the Mapuche people. However, the Chilean state does not even acknowledge in the constitution the existence of this Aboriginal community that has lived in these lands for centuries. Paula Bracknick, Telesur. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The Ugandan Electoral Commission has banned political rallies ahead of the 2021 general elections, offering the choice of campaigning on social media, television and radio. Electoral Commission Chairperson Justice Simon 
by Yakima. Court noted that the decision aims to limit the spread of the novel coronavirus, highlighting a risk assessment issued by health authorities. The Commission has also released a new roadmap of electoral activities while setting a start of the nomination process for presidential candidates for November. Meanwhile, health authorities have reported over 1,200 COVID-19 cases and five fatalities. The Independent Electoral Commission of Ivory Coast announced on Tuesday that over 900,000 new voters have been registered on the electoral roll, while highlighting that there is no reason to postpone the, electoral, the elections set for October this year. We finally got, after due processing, processing that consisted of actually checking whether the people on the voters list merit being there and meet the conditions. So in the end, we got 1,647,693. There are 904,956 new voters on the electoral roll, up from 277,956 new voters in 2018. As things stand, the election will not be postponed. There is no reason to postpone the election. We said that in our timeline, we have the revision of the electoral register, and the law says that electoral register must be revised and posted three months in advance. That is what we did. And then it takes 45 days, two months, to receive the nomination papers. That's what we're doing. The novel coronavirus pandemic has caused nearly $45 million in losses to Rwanda's tourism sector. Meanwhile, an innovative alternative has been developed to offer virtual tours of Rwanda's capital, Kigali. It's, uh, it's unfortunate that the, the pandemic hit the industry in general, but for me as a virtual tour content creator, it was actually an opportunity. So people were vi visiting the places, using the content I've created, and also they got to understand the importance and the advantage the virtual tours can bring to the industry as a whole. So the virtual tourism would create need for the people because there are so many, uh, I would say, uh, tourism activities for which people don't know. So the best way to do it is to start virtual. You expose those packages to the potential tourists and then after looking at them, seeing them, they will be much interested. Then the virtual tourism will be a marketing tool for the tourism. Uh, this will never replace the traditional tourism because uh, nothing will really replace uh, the fact that people can be at places, at location and see the things with their, with their own eyes. So this is more uh, a different layer of information uh, which can actually uh, push people, uh, give them uh, a sense of, a glimpse of what they would expect if they visited the place uh, physically. Tanzania's main opposition party, Chadema, this Tuesday nominated former Member of Parliament Tundi Lisu as its presidential candidate to contest the general elections to be held in October this year. Tundi Lisu had returned to Tanzania from exile in late July, announcing that he was planning to fight for the presidency. The opposition figure has openly criticised current president John Magafuli, saying his response to the novel coronavirus pandemic is a national embarrassment. Lisu was serving as a member of parliament when he suffered an assassination attempt in September 2017 in the capital, Dodoma. Shot 16 times, he fled the country and underwent more than 20 operations while receiving treatment in Belgium. Kenyan health authorities reported 605 new COVID-19 cases on Tuesday, taking the total number to over 23,000. The Cabinet Administrative Secretary for Health, Rashid Aman, noted that 582 of the new cases were Kenyans and 27 were foreigners. Meanwhile, 587 patients were discharged from health facilities in the last 24 hours, bringing the total number of recoveries to over 9,000. The COVID-19 death toll now stands at 388. Thousands of Indian troops imposed a curfew with razor wire and steel barricades in Kashmir on Tuesday before the first anniversary of India's abolition of the region's special status. Prime Minister Narendra Modi stripped the region of its autonomy on August 5, 2019, promising peace and prosperity after three decades of violence that saw tens of thousands of people killed.
Officials announced a two-day curfew on Monday, claiming that intelligence reports indicated protests were planned in the Muslim-majority region of 7 million people. Locals have called for the anniversary to be marked as a black day. Police vehicles patrolled after dark on Monday and again on Tuesday morning, with officers using megaphones to order residents to remain indoors. Meanwhile, India's health ministry announced on Monday that the country's total COVID-19 cases have surpassed 1.8 million. In the last 24 hours, authorities reported almost 53,000 new cases. Meanwhile, over 700 people with COVID-19 died over the past 24 hours, taking the death toll to 38,000. India is focusing on testing more people with over 20 million COVID-19 tests conducted up until Sunday. The key third mainland bridge in the Nigerian city of Lagos is partially closed for renovations for a six-month period, worsening traffic in the country's economic capital. The third mainland is Africa's second largest bridge, stretching 12 kilometers along Lagos Lagoon to link Lagos Island, the economic heart of the city, with the mainland where most people live. Its partial closure has had a serious impact on the economy, with one economist saying that productivity loss due to traffic congestion comes to as much as 383 million U.S. dollars. And we've come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellysoenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Tellysoenglish, I'm Katrina Goss and thank you for watching.